Well, speaking of, uh, of, of the unknown, which is what we've been talking about a bunch uh, this hour, it seemed unknown if you were going to actually make it to the theater yeah. on time to do this show. Your flight had you landing about 15 minutes before we started. Who is booking your travel? Well, the real culprit in all of this is Nick Kristoff and actually his publication. So here's the story. So I get down to my, uh, the door of my apartment building in the morning. And, and I you have, live in New York City, we should mention. That is correct. So I have to fly across the country to San Francisco up here, and I've budgeted a certain amount of room in my bag for the Saturday slash Sunday New York Times. So it's quite a bit. I jettison the travel, automobile, and real estate section, but still quite a thick newspaper. But it was extra thick today. And so I said, what's going on? And it turns out they had delivered two New York Times. Is New York's Times. Yes. It's like and, Attorneys General. Yes. So I, By the way, many of the articles were about the Attorneys General. Yes. In those New York's Times. Yes. And there was also some ad for Popper's Jalapeno in the <laughs> back. So I saw the other name on the New York Times was a, uh, an M. Worth, no, M. Westmuller, M. Westmuller, and the address was right across the street. So even though this is definitionally not my problem, it's happened to me, I'm going to give M. Worthmuller her New York Times. But it's raining out, and I knew if I, if I saw a cab, I had to take it. So I start to go across the street, and I see a cab. And I'm doing the timing. I'm like, I go right across the street, I can put it in front of the door, and I'll still get the cab. And it's all going to work. And then the light is turning yellow, because the cab is on the other side. And when it turns red, it's, and then it's going to turn green, and then I'm going to be able to come. The, the light on my side. So I'm across the street, but I'm misaligned. I'm about three doors down. Now it's red. So I go those three doors down. Uh -oh. Now the light is green. I know what happens. The cab starts going. John I, Candy steals your cab. <laughs> And it was I, the worst Christmas ever. I go to give the New York Times, I go to put it on this person's vestibule, whatever, and she's there. M. Worthmuller is there looking confused. And I say, M. Worthmuller? And she says, I'm Mary Worthmuller. And I say, that's probably good enough. Here's your New York Times. And she takes it and says, I just want to, no, you can't thank me. I just want to thank you because, well, no, you can't thank me. And I go and the Times sort of disintegrates and I had not removed or jettisoned her real estate uh, <laughs> travel. travel or automobile. Yeah. It sort of goes over the, all over the place. She's looking stricken. I miss the cab. All right, fine. It's raining. I I know statistically another cab will come along pretty soon. I mean, the first cab I saw had its light on. Yeah. But Luke, you know about anecdotes. Would this be an anecdote if another cab came along within 23 minutes? It wouldn't be a good one. No. It's <laughs> skirting that territory now. It turns out cabs at this hour are like Brigadoon. <laughs> we're like the, all right, you missed the 212. No, yeah. one's not coming around for Who another. Who did you call? Godot Cab Service. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> So literally, I downloaded Uber in the 23 minutes as I was waiting for the cab, and that's how I made it to the airport. Well, we are very glad that you got here, Mike. Anyway, we are out of time, but it's been great <laughs> having you on Livewire. Um, you made a huge leap recently from a sports reporter, staff reporter at NPR, uh, to hosting a, a, a weekday daily podcast that's uh, created by Slate called The Gist. Right. And I am just such a fan of, of your show. I listen to it each and every day. And one of the things I love about it is that I always find out about some topic that you have focused on that day that is not the thing I got out of bed. Yeah thinking I had an interest in hearing about yeah. on that particular day. And what I thought we could do is I could fire some of these recent gist topics at okay. you, and you could give us, for the people who missed the show, and by the way, how dare you, for those of you who missed that episode of the gist, you can kind of catch them up. Okay. Can we try that? Sure. Okay. Um, naps. Do they help or hurt a person's health and productivity? Okay, so this is part of an ongoing segment we have, a science segment called is that bullshit? And we have acclaimed science writer Maria Konnikova, and we play Is That Bullshit? And she really convinced me that naps can be good if everything about them is perfect. If you have the sort of circadian rhythm or whatever science term she used, that you could go on and off and shut it on and off perfectly. Also, if you come out of it not too short, where you get no benefit, but not too long. Because if you nap, if you over nap, then your rhythms are screwed up. So, in essence, except for the talented 10% of nappers, naps are bullshit. I... 
I was, um, for a decade of my life, it started because I was working in morning radio, and, and you have done that too at times, and it's just you're exhausted all the time because you're getting up at three in the morning or something. I started napping a lot, and then I carried it over into my 30s, and then I just was like the biggest evangel evangelist for napping because I was like, you just feel so much better. And then what I realized was, no, this was because I had a drinking problem, <laughs> and I was basically hung over every single morning. <laughs> So I had to have a nap to catch up, and since I've been dialing that back, naps have turned out to be bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Sco but, scotch naps, though, the scientists haven't studied. Well, they keep trying to, <laughs> but then they just get angry and get in some kind of a fight because of the scotch. Um, this is Live Wire Radio. We're talking to Mike Pesca from uh, The Gist. We're asking about some of these uh, recent topics. All right, what happened when someone pulled the most elaborate bomb planting in history in a Reno, Nevada casino. It worked, blew a hole in the casino. It was a thousand pound bomb. I mean, the 70s were so screwed up. I've also talked about how screwed up the 70s were. Like, we forget this. Maybe if you're under 30, you never lived it. But if you're 40 like I am, 41, like dams were breaking, like dozens of people died like every week from a dam breaking, skyjackings. And yeah, some guy actually blew a hole in a casino and they spent years finding him and they still teach the bomb in the FBI because it was so elaborately conceived. And what was he trying to do with this? Uh, I don't know. He, they made him hit on a soft 17. I wasn't sure. <laughs> no, actually. <laughs> oh, man. Four people liked that joke, but they really liked it. And I was, by the way, three of them. <laughs> Um, he had a beef with the casino. He was both a brilliant guy and an angry guy who also was great at making bombs, but not really good at much else. Um, and he almost got away with it too, right? If it wasn't for those meddling kids, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Baumgartner! <laughs> they unmasked him. <laughs> why, are we, um, why are we seeing the decline of the pop song? Well, the fade-out is uh, declining. And the reason the fade-out is declining, this is very interesting, is because when you... Uh, <laughs> people will think they're... That's great, because that's up. the radio equivalent of a sight gag. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually the one thing that works better on radio than on TV. I'm actually doing an interview with a guy who wrote a book about things that aren't funny anymore, and... Please tell me he did not mention this show and or my monologues. No, no, no. Because I've already been on a few lists and I don't enjoy it. No, no, no Luke, anymore. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cursing you, but... <laughs> cover, but cover of the book of things that aren't funny anymore, Anvil falling on someone's head. And it's true. Is that because we now understand just how bad that would be for your brain. Yeah. Like the traumatic, right. I mean, I, exactly. I say this without even. Back in the 40s, we thought it built character. Right. Um, no, but I'm being serious. I was raised on anvils. What, anvils aren't good enough for you? Here's an anvil. <laughs> I, at some point, and you'll know this as you guys get to know Mike, at some point it always turns into the premise for a Bruce Springsteen song. <laughs> the father, who's the son, doesn't think the anvils are good enough. Anvils, they were born to fall! <laughs> um, it is true. But that is why, right? Honestly, we understand now how bad that would be, so it, it's not funny to us, because we're like, oh, they'd be dead if that happened. <laughs> Is that why that's I not guess, considered but like, funny? You, I, you know what? My kids watch a lot of cartoons, and like the whole skirting death thing is eliminated for, from cartoons. Now it's like an intermingling of Spanish phrases. That has right. that is cha that is replaced. Dora the Explorer. Death. Yeah, has zero anvil right. interactions. All right, back to the back to the fade out. Why is the fade Bruce, out? On the other hand. Fading um, out. I think it's just trends. And, you know, I think, uh, what was the year? Maybe 1984. Of the top ten songs that ended the year, every single one had a fade out. The last three, four Give years... Give me an example, if you remember, one of those songs. Um, and the band is going to play it. I think it's... I think probably Let's Get Physical. Guys, I, on three. One, two... <laughs> yeah. Oh, does it? It's weird when you... When you listen on the radio, you don't realize the song is all drums. Yeah. And so, <laughs> light vocals. It sounds different. You know, so many songs that seem, as I pointed out, the song Not Fade Away ends in a fade out. So, like, every song ended in a fade out. And I think, I think it just the, 
I, you know, I think it's just trends. Now there's been, I think, an overcorrection. And so in the last three years, if you look at all the songs that have ended top 10, that um, Blurred Lines is literally the only of the last 30, 10 most popular songs every year that ended in a fade out for Robin Thicke's career and for Noah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you can add uh, to that list of things that used to happen a lot and don't happen any longer? TV intro theme songs. That tell the story. That tell the story yeah, yeah, of how yeah. Mr. Belvedere ended up with this family. Yeah. And I, I attribute that to attention span yeah. and also the ability to change the channel. Like if the remote control hadn't have been invented, we would still be sitting through the theme songs, but they're terrified that you'll get bored and change the channel, so they just get right to it. I think that uh, maybe they assume that we're all second screening it and Googling, well, what's the backstory on this? Right. We got a Wikipedia page open. But also in the 70s, another weird TV theme song was, trend was, all these horribly depressing shows with these jaunty theme songs. Oh, yeah. Like Sanford and Son, that seemed fun. The guy lives in a junkyard. I'm coming, Elizabeth, he just wants to die. Right. -na -na -na, -na 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 -na. <laughs> and they were all like that. And then there's Maud. She's a horribly depressed person. But then there's Maud. <laughs> what about? I don't know if the theme song was upbeat, but whoever successfully pitched a sitcom about a Nazi prison camp. Yeah. That's pretty. That's incredible. Like, wait, 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 wait. Stay with me. They're hilarious Nazis, and they're pretty incompetent. Can we can we throw in some humor against the French too? Sure. Oh yeah, that'll yeah. sell it. Yeah. Uh, Mike Pesca. <laughs> I know nothing. A lot of this show, too, if you don't know, is just me badly impersonating lines from Hogan's Heroes. <laughs> so you're welcome. Um, Mike, uh, last question. What can you do with your podcast, The Gist, uh, that you weren't able to do on NPR? Curse like a sailor. <laughs> well, I'm encouraged to now. In fact, I have a quota to meet. They don't tell you that. It eventually starts to feel like pressure, doesn't it? Podcasts are really, uh, people feel them really personally, so I could go niche, and I don't have to do the thing where I slow down and say, Bono, the lead singer of you too. So there's no... You actually singer. did an entire um, <laughs> sort of, uh, what would you call it? Was it officially a spiel? It might have been a spiel. This is the uh, signature ending of the show that goes where on. Where you talked about the fact that when you listen to public radio, yeah. you, they make everybody explain who everybody is all the time. Right, right. And it's very hard because I'm sure there are some elements of the audience, but whenever I hear something I don't know, I mean, I just think of myself as a listener, I don't say, damn you for introducing knowledge that I didn't know already. Like, that's why I'm listening to public radio. So, yeah, so there's a little bit, you know, I, I maybe talk a little too quickly. I'm perhaps at times daring the audience to uh, keep up with me. Um, there's, there's more of a kinship. It's, you know, I allow myself to be really niche, and the thing I always say is, you know, if I'm not pissing someone off, I'm not doing it right now. I don't mean to be specifically pressing buttons, but I want to say things like the number one thing isn't first don't offend. And I do think with public radio, there's a little bit of that, right? There's a little bit of the Hippocratic oath. Hypocritic oath? <laughs> Hypocritical? Yeah. I mean, I guess if you were criticizing somebody who had killed somebody else, but you had also killed someone, that would be a <laughs> hypocritic, Hippocratic oath. Right. Boy, that was labored. <laughs> Right, like, if there was a dude with a t-shirt that says, do harm, and he was the guy giving you the oath, that would be the hypocritic, yeah. hypocritic oath, yeah. I know one person, Mike, who you have offended, and it's M. Worthmuller, who's just standing in New York with a destroyed newspaper at her feet from a guy who wouldn't talk to her as he threw it to her. She's like, I gotta go to Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Pesca, ladies and gentlemen.